Hey, Happy New Year! Hope you had a good Christmas too. I just hung out, took care of my geese and chickens, took out the snow machine for a little bit. But let's have a little Snake Island coffee. So, I was wondering what would be the theme for today, and then I thought about, well, Cali, it's like everything is revolving around the idea of fraud and defrauding and my opinions on that based on the research that I've done and the experiences that I've had as team leader on Discovery Channel's Treasure Quest Snake Island. So, I mean, in, in my book, I describe a lot of this. I mean, a lot of you guys are asking questions about this and that, like Cody Lundin and all that kind of stuff. I go into some pretty dang good detail in my book. So I hope you're not treating TV or YouTube as like the end all. Remember what I said about that guy that, uh, one of the fans that wrote, there's no need for me to read a book because we have Discovery Channel? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know whether to laugh or cry about that. So, no. Don't watch YouTube. Don't watch this show that I keep on giving to you as the end all. Because all the answers are not in there. All the descriptions are not in here. They're in here in the book. This is in order for you to go and pick up a copy of the book and read the book. And read other books. I'm trying to get people to read again. Because it's amazing. People think that TV is a substitute for actual education. And it's wild that I'm kind of still freaked that Discovery Communications has an education arm because according to David Zasloff in one article I read, he was all excited about the idea of getting rid of traditional reading materials. That's mind-blowing. God, man, it's just like, I hate that conspiracies, but man, if you think about conspiracies and the idea of dumbing down a civilization, dumbing down a society... What better way to do it than through a medium that just about everybody's got? I mean, that used to blow me away. Even like 20, 30 years ago, you'd be like out in the jungle. You'd be out in some places that they couldn't even fly a plane into. But yet, out of these little villages, you'd have a TV antenna. And way out in the boonies, they'd get a reception and they would be getting all this content. Whatever that was. Back then, you know, it wasn't as bad as it is now where we have the situation that we have over Discovery Communications and the stuff that we have over, which I've observed as a third party at History Channel, and uh, which is wild because History Channel had a show called Myth Hunters. Well, if you remember that show Myth Hunters, it's interesting that they had Richard Knight and my story about sneaking into Vietnam. And about 30% of that is inaccurate. And nobody contacted me about it, which I found amazing. And I don't know if Richard Knight was still alive by that time, but they should have talked to him, but I guess they didn't. That's the thing about history and how it gets on TV. But what I like to talk about is tracks. Remember I talked about previously in a previous episode about my background in counseling, and I talked about the stages, the hunter, warrior, healer, and how you became the healer in traditional um, healing practices in the tribal, tribal ways. Well, tracking is very important. And one of the questions that perhaps maybe you should be asking yourself was, how in the world, considering my background, did I end up on Treasure Quest Snake Island? Because if you look at my background, it's pretty standard. And I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you an idea about the difference between what I did professionally. And there was one moment in my journalism career, one small moment as a photojournalist, that I did something that is basically what Discovery Channel's reality TV industry, History Channel's reality TV industry is all based on, which is the use of visual media, visual image, using images to create a, an emotional response in you as the audience. 
But let's go first and look at some of my photographs. So as you look at the string of photographs that I'm putting up for you to look at, you'll see my uh, um, some work I did with the Marine Corps where I was going out on, on training, training uh, with the uh, U.S. Marine Corps. And you'll see some of that photography, and you see that photography, and then you'll also see some, some combat photography. You'll see combat photography. You'll see me in, with the uh, LERPs, the Salvadoran LERPs, and uh, where I'm on the ground with them, but I'm also up in the air after. And I've got combat photography of the um, helicopter shooting down at the gorillas and the gorillas are shooting back, back up at us and this this air cover is for the lerps that are down below that are in an ambush um, that was set up by the FMLN and then you'll also see photography with the uh, Salvadoran Navy SEALs where I take photographs of the Salvadoran Navy SEALs and then uh, the sniper steps on a landmine and he uh, loses his foot okay so the key to remember about all these things, all these images, is that they are happening, and I am just the eye. I am the all-knowing eye seeing what's happening and capturing it through my camera, okay, and still photography. That takes a number of things. That is the, I, the ability to read a situation, to know when something's going to come up and be ready to capture that, that event as it comes in. Uh, also in, in situations where you can't uh, know what's going to happen exactly, i.e. Uh, the sniper uh, stepping on a landmine, uh, being able to respond quickly to that and then to capture that. Then uh, we've got um, imagery with the uh, Nicaraguan Contras at a hospital, and you see things that are happening, such as... Uh, um, a, a young boy who had uh, lost his leg, and so he's got a uh, prosthesis. So these are actions that are happening. And as a true photojournalist, you observe it, and then you capture it as quickly as you can, whether it's with, uh, nowadays it's with video, back in that day. Um, well, back then it was video too. I mean, we're, if we go even further back, you know, uh, you'd have the... Uh, Small cam uh, movie cameras that people would, uh, that journalists would carry for the newsreels that be sent back to uh, to, the, to uh, the network. You'd have uh, the still photography that I specialized in. Uh, we'd go back to the uh, to the office to the to the bureau, and then you would um, have it developed, or you would develop yourself, depending on who they had uh, uh, manning the uh, the station. And then you would um, uh, give it to the bureau chief, and the bureau chief would decide. And then it would be sent back to headquarters through a, uh, back in those days it was telex. We were still using telex. Now it's all email, and it's sent through the internet. So, yeah, we've got uh, photography with the Contras. Then we've got... Um, Photography I did with the Forest Service. I got uh, a contract working for the Forest Service, and so I'd cover uh, logging operations for the Forest Service. I'd cover uh, forest fires. There was the big one in, uh, where was that? In the Santa Barbara, Santa Maria uh, area that I got these images in with the uh, flame retardant being uh, dropped out of the plains. Then there was also the photography being taken in uh, Orleans, I think the photographs are still there at the uh, at the main office up there. Um, and then we go to what I call the discovery style of journalism or quote documentary. So here we have these photographs of these uh, two little girls, um, and basically what I did was I set up the uh, the scene. I took my, my M16, that's my M16 that I carried uh, when I was working on, on this uh, operation. And um, then I talked to the RTOs, I took the uh, radio operator's uh, uh, radio and I had that set up. And I set up this scene. And so I had one, one of the, uh, the little girls 
standing next to, to, the, to the radio and I took a snapshot of her. And then I took another shot uh, with the M16 with the girls. And why did I shoot this? Let me tell you. You've probably seen the photograph. It's a pretty, I, I can't remember who shot it, but it was from Vietnam. And it's a, it's a photograph of a Vietnamese child, a Vietnamese boy, a young baby boy. It's about the same age as these girls. And that's actually when I saw these girls, I said, oh, wow. And here we were in the situation, and we had all this, this, this armament and all this war gear. And, and it was the same thing. I said, okay, here's a situation. This can be like a statement. This is a statement about war. You know, it even appealed to me, you know, with my background, having been about the same age as these, these children when I saw war. For the first time, well, I was a little bit older, but you know, just like a year or two at the most. Um, but so that appealed to me is just to show how does war affect, you know, a society and affects through the children because the children then continue, and it's that's why we have these cycles, you know, where people go through and we have a war, we have a war culture, and we have a war society, and it's one thing if it's an adult, but. It gets an imp there's an imprinting for the same way with me. It's like my memories of Vietnam affected my thought patterns and the way that I dealt with war and even the idea that I would feel um, compelled to go to war. You know, why would I do that? Well, okay, so here was my opportunity to make a statement about like, you know, war and how it affects the children and how it affects the society and it affects is a very emotional, dramatic shot because you see something as um, remote, removed from, from the emotion, which is an M16. An M16 is an M16. You know, a radio, a PRC-77. It's just, it's just a radio, but these are tools of war. Okay? And then you have a child. And then you have these children. So there's a conflict. And so this takes us back to this photograph I was talking about in Vietnam. That was taken in Vietnam. It was a black and white, as I recall, and I had seen it. And you know, when I was I was doing my own. I, when you're a photographer, you look at everybody else's other work and you go back to previous works. That's why a lot of the interesting photography, like from Burroughs and everything, you look at some of the photographs taken from Vietnam, and you could actually transpose them to photographs that were taken during the the American Civil War, because a lot of the photographers would look at those, and and I even look at it and say, "Well, God, you're on a battlefield." And you see these bodies, let me capture that. But that's the difference with the journalism, is you might see something that, because wars are wars, and everything and bodies laying on battlefields can be similar very, very much throughout different wars. And it's how you capture it as a photojournalist, as a combat photojournalist, that either has impact or doesn't have impact. So here's a situation where I want to have dramatic effect. I want to have emotional effect. But the difference from the previous photographs that you've seen that have effect is that those were happening naturally and I was just capturing it. Here is a photograph that's totally set up. I asked the mother and said, hey, can you have your children come over here? I'd love to just take a, a quick shot of them. You're right here next, next to, to this, this, I didn't say war gear, but I mean basically this war gear. And here's the, here's the dramatic effect of here's these innocent children and here are the tools of war, okay? In the same way, this previous photograph in Vietnam where here's a Vietnamese boy, a baby, you know, still in his diapers, just like these girls and everything. And um, instead of the uh, M16 and the radio, it's, it's a spent, as I recall, it was either like a, uh, a spent law rocket or a bazooka, or it was a, um, a spent... Uh, Artillery shell. I think, as I recall in my memory, it was a, an artillery shell. And there was the baby and the artillery shell. And, man, if you find it, I'd love to see this photograph again. It was actually really good. It was a powerful photograph. And in the same way that as you look at my photograph here, I think you see the power of it to see, wow, there's... Because everybody looks at combat photography and they see the men fighting and the, the women fighting and the, the adults fighting and just doing things of war, like... Of, of walking and, and patrolling and, and, and um, carrying weapons and all this kind of stuff. But it's when you look at the children and you look at contrast. Like here's, in the, here's another photograph where we're getting ready to take off 
on a helicopter. So the, the helicopters are landing into a soccer field, okay? And we're going back, we're going back out on an operation. And so here is this boy, and you can't see his face because I don't want you to see his face. I could have lit it up, but for dramatic effect. But the difference is, this is not set up. So look at the difference between the two babies and the two little girls and the armaments, which is totally set up, set up for dramatic effect. And then you've got here a dramatic effect with, uh, but it's happening naturally. I knelt down, I saw the helicopter coming in and uh, uh, one of the uh, commandos had his, uh, his back to me, but then you see the children and then you also see the young boy looking at me, but his face is dark, and I didn't light him up with a flash. I could have, but I didn't, because I wanted him to be nondescript. I wanted it to not be focused on the idea of a specific child, but just the idea of youth. And just the contrast between everything and how everything is, is bouncing around. Here's another photograph, you know, for that is naturally happening, but I think is, is one of my favorite shots because of direction. It's how movement goes through a, through a photograph. So you see, check it. So you see the commando, and he's looking to his left, and then you see the way the light comes off the uh, the uh, the log that's lifting that holds up the roof. Then you have the uh, the way the light comes off the uh, the pot. Then you've got the the Rambo image. You've got the Rambo Rambo image on the woman's uh, chest on her T-shirt, and then the way she's looking down away from the direction of the commando, and then the chicken that's got its head turned in. So they're both having almost like a shy reaction to the look. So it's, it's, it's a photograph of light and the way the light goes across the image, and which I'm capturing in the, in the, in the film. And then there is the, um, the direction of everything, the direction of everybody's gaze through this photograph. So look at the dramatic, the, the effect of that. That was natural. I saw it. I captured it. And that's the thing. That's what really turned me on about photojournalism was the idea that I had the ability to see events. Sometimes I, I would be able to prepare for them. A lot of times I just had to be fast. That's why we train ourselves to be able to flip through, you know, on our ISOs and our apertures without having to look down. We could just do it by feel, you know, just like being able to take an M16 and put it back together in the dark, you know, or a, a handgun. Take it apart and put it back together so that you could you you could do it without having to look at it. Okay, that's skill. That's practice, 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 practice. And then it's a point where your your subconscious. It's just like with martial arts. You know, you do katas and everything, and you you do your training, or you like you do uh, combat shooting. You do uh, uh, concealed carry, where you just practice and practice and practice. So when you actually need it, you don't have to think about it. And that's the same with not only the actual mechanics of running a camera but then also at the same time actually capturing that shot. And that's what I was so proud about in my photography as a photojournalist. And then the one moment in my whole professional career as a photojournalist, I set up a shot. And that shot was with the girls and the M16 and the girl with the radio. Totally set up, totally for emotional impact. And that's exactly what happens at Discovery's reality TV because it's scripted. It might, it's how, how the scripting goes. And Treasure Coast Snake Island, it was 100% uh, scripted. But the way they got around it was, was like, instead of say, sometimes they actually told us exactly what to say, word for word in our, and with our own emotion, they said, well, okay, well, if you're feeling like this, and you say these words as though you're feeling like this. So we're doing method acting and reading the script. Then other times they said, well, how would you respond in this situation? See, they'd already prepped it when they did the casting on Skype that I had talked about before, okay? But how can somebody who has my background and actually just once did a discovery type of documentary, which is the photograph with the girls and the M16 and the radio, how can somebody who had that previous background of actually doing proper photojournalism, capturing as it happened, and that's the skill of a true photojournalist, not setting it up, okay? How did I get from there to, the, to being on a Treasure Quest show that's totally scripted? Because they lied to me. Yeah. In the same way that they lie to you as the audience, 
telling you that we're finding all these treasures, that, that I put the team together. Man, I put teams together back in Central America. My buddies from that time, they said, you didn't put that team together, did you? And I'm like, you tell me. No. I did not put the Treasure Quest team together. I didn't look at their backgrounds and see how amazing they were. For No. That was Mac Pictures. Mac Pictures hired us all as actors, which I didn't realize until I was on set. Because the lie that was given to me by Aaron Burke at Mac Pictures, Mac Pictures, M-A-K, that's Mark, I don't know what his middle name is, Caden. That's what Mac stands for. They're the field production company that's hired by Discovery. And they made other shows like, well, they made the third episode of uh, Sakambaya. Oh, and Sean Cowles. We'll talk about Sean Cowles in a later episode. Why did I know about Sean Cowles? I, yeah, in this book. So you want to be a reality TV star? Everything I learned about sex, drugs, fraud, rock and roll, and vipers as dis- team leader of Discovery Channel's Treasure Quest Snake Island. Got to get a copy. It's over at Amazon. There's a link right below. All you got to do is click on it. It'll take it right over. You can get Kindle or you can get paperback. Read it now. It'll freaking blow you away. And get a copy for your friends who probably love a lot of this reality TV because it's fine if you just enjoy it for what it is, which is fake. Totally fake, 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 fake. But is the acting worth the time? And when you realize that it is fake, would you actually watch the show? I wouldn't watch the show. I don't watch the show. The only reason I watch the show is I'm trying to find out what they actually put in there because they shoot a lot of roll. B-roll, they shoot actual roll where we're actually, where they're telling us to go and do things, you know, like the rolling of the backpack, the rolling of all this. That's the thing about it. We're hired as actors. And some of us knew that they were coming on as actors. Megan, in my honest opinion, she knew because the way she got on the show is she had a manager and an agent. I don't have a manager and an agent. Brett Teeter, he's another actor. He's been in the business for a while. I mean, like, really pushing, 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 trying to get in there. Because he doesn't want to do that construction. Which is ironic that he got on a show called Trading Spaces. But he was always telling us, God, I can't, I, I got to get make this, this, this film business really work for me. Because I just, I don't want to go back to Texas and do that anymore. Okay? So think about that. Then you got people like Keith Plaskett and me, where they're calling us because we have real backgrounds. Bonafide backgrounds. You know, Megan, she has a background in freediving, but I never heard anything about the archaeology aspect until Treasure Quest. And it's just wild that Discovery is creating all these shows from Hollywood. And the idea that I'm being told I'm going to come on a uh, treasure hunting expedition that I'm thinking is a bona fide archaeological expedition that I don't find out until two weeks in when we're filming in Brazil that it's totally, totally fabricated. And then some of you say, well, shoot, you did two seasons. And I go, yeah. I thought by the second season they like put a disclaimer. I mean, I thought it'd get around. But it was really interesting because there's a lawyer over at I wrote about that in the book, was Bob Thompson. Bob Thompson's actually asked, so, and this is when they're trying to negotiate for me to come back. And I said, I'm not going to come back on this. Why? What's the point of coming back on this? And it's like, you guys don't even pay properly. And it's dangerous. I mean, the snakes were dangerous. That was real. The only thing that was truly, truly real about everything was the danger involved of dealing with the venomous snakes. That's it. But you, you can get the same experience by throwing a guy in a pit with a bunch of snakes. Hey, see who comes up. But that's what it is. It's set up for drama in the same way that that one moment in my whole professional life that I did it once and I said, man, you know, I can't can't do this stuff. It's it's just, it's basically I was doing propaganda. It was anti-war propaganda at that time. Taking a picture, kid, oh God, that's horrible. You know, why? The war, the children. That's the theme right there. Which is actually, it's it's exactly the same thing that was done on Treasure Quest. It was like, oh my God. Treasure hunt, excitement, how do we build it? What emotional response do we want from the audience? In the same way that I was saying, what kind of emotional response do I want from a viewer of my photograph? Which is, war sucks, it affects the children, we don't want that to happen. 
Discovery, through Mac Pictures, is basically saying, hey, what can we do to get everybody excited and to come back for the next show? Well, yeah, let's script this so they're on the show and appeal to all the things that that appeals to people who are excited about treasure, which is the idea you're going to go and find something new that nobody's ever found. Uh, it's a thing that you're going to get wealth. So how, how does that appeal to someone who who might not have a job? And it's like, God, man, I just want to take a break. I want, like I said, remember, it's just like, you know, just sit on the couch, watch TV, have a beer, relax from the day, either go back to the grind again or go look for a grind because they're unemployed. This is what Discovery is looking at. And it doesn't matter, Discovery, about anything other than advertising. How can that advertising dollar come in? And then, this is the thing about it, because Americans are starting to pick up on it. But where they're making the money is over in Europe and Asia and all these other countries. I mean, I'm kind of impressed with Putin in the terms of that's one of the things he probably did the best for his country is he made it illegal. As I recall, he made it illegal for the uh, private uh, commercialization of of TV broadcast. So basically saying you can't sell advertising for TV in uh, in Russia, which wiped out any revenue coming in from Russia. So then David Zaslav's got to run around and try and get more money from these other countries where they're allowed to. And think about it. Here we supposedly have laws against fraud and defrauding, which in my honest opinion, Discovery's been doing for quite a long time with the program that they've been delivering. And nobody's talked about it. Because they either benefited from it in terms of hoping that they're going to get another show and get on another show, i.e., in my honest opinion, Jeremy Whalen and Brett Tudor, or they're just terrified of the NDA and think that an NDA that keeps you quiet about criminal activity is binding. It's not. And if we live in a society where the legal system is actually going to say it is binding, we're in trouble. And that's something for you to think about. So as you look at my lawsuits, the ones I've got against Discovery and the ones that now they've done as a countersuit in order to shut up my book because they don't want, they don't want you to read this book. Remember, the reason I came on with the YouTube channel is to make sure you have the opportunity to know you should go pick up a copy of this book because they don't want you to read this book. If you read this book, you'll know what's really up. Not like, oh, well, you know, your buddy's saying, no, you can't believe that stuff that's in that show. You know, it it, it looks too fake. There's a big difference between somebody like that saying that and somebody like me who's been on the show and actually has a real reputation and a background and got suckered into the show through a lie. Because my view was, okay, yeah, I get on a TV show. Because everybody says, I mean, that's why you get on TV and you sell books. That's where the big book deals happen anyway. But it's wild. It's like I didn't sell hardly any books off of the first season. But that's because David Zasloff and the whole Discovery Communications, in my honest opinion, is relying on the fact that you don't want to go and educate yourself and read. You'd rather just sit back and be spoon-fed this pablum that is fake. And it only appeals to you because of dramatic effect. In the same way, I'm sorry to say, from my own photojournalism experience, the photograph with with the children and and the gun, it's pablum. It's just propaganda. That was true propaganda. The other stuff was journalism that I'm proud of because that was work that I did. It was recording what was happening. It was historical fact. The other one was just totally set up in the same way of Treasure Quest. And I'd like you to think about that until our next talk. Because our next talk, we're going to talk about the Special Forces community and how the reality TV industry has been affecting that. And man, (laughs) I'm mind blown that there are people that are being used as representatives of the U.S. Army Special Forces. And the SWIC, SWIC is the Green Beret, that's, you know, the, uh, the Kennedy School for Army Special Forces, are using certain types of individuals on reality TV to like build 
interest in, hey, I want to go become a Green Beret. And it's kind of mind-blowing because it's like, what, the military's not learned that? They didn't learn what they learned in Vietnam when John Wayne's movie came out and the effect that that had on the Green Berets? Or how, in my generation, Charlie Sheen, um, in the movie, was it Navy SEALs? And how that affected the SEAL community? Oh, yeah. That's what happens when you let a media corporation, you let a media industry so disconnected from reality and history take control of history and lead a society. Because, remember, my photograph with the kids and the gun, with the M16 and the and the radio, that was propaganda. So, if you wanted to destroy a society and you wanted to remove the military as part of that destruction of that society, you've read about this probably, you know, and how there are certain groups who would love to destroy the military in the United States. Would you do it from the outside or would you do it from the inside? And how would you use people in order to do that and use qualities of people. We'll talk about that in the next episode. Sad. But anyway, I wanted to explain some things about how I got on the show, which was, I was flat out lied to. Yeah, they said I was coming on a expedition hunting for treasure. And then when I got there, I was like, wait a minute. This is a movie. This is like, oh, my first experience in movies. The Killing Fields. Running around as a Marine extra. 45 bucks a month. I mean, a day, actually, which was my rent at 45 bucks in the slums of Bangkok back in 83. Yeah, just a movie, scripted, Hollywood. It's not like David Attenborough, you know, where they're actually going and recording this footage. They get the footage from a variety of people, and they bring it in. They put a documentary together because it actually happened naturally most of the time. And then it's recorded and edited, and then it becomes a documentary. Okay, and that's what I want to leave you with is the difference between documentary and how reality TV is produced. And it's fine if it's a game show. It's fine if it's Big Brother. That's something else. But when you have a show that is depicting events that could affect historical record, i.e. finding treasure or was Adolf Hitler in Argentina... And it's scripted. You tell me how that affects what we consider history. And if you look at all the problems that we have in our society right now, and how you have people who are running through the streets yelling that they're anti-fascist, and yet they use the tactics of the brown shirt in the 30s, what do you think that really means when you have a society that has no understanding of history because the vanguards, or the people who are supposed to be the vanguards, the people who call themselves, in Discovery Communications as an example, the last true documentary network. This is supposed to be a vanguard. And yet they're the ones who are perpetrating, in my honest opinion, the fraud and defrauding the audience. So, I'll leave you with that. I really hope you pick up a copy of this book and read it. Got it on Kindle, got it on paperback. So you want to be a reality TV star. It's not just about discovery. It's about the whole reality TV industry. And it's about how it's affecting our society. Next episode, I'll be talking about the special forces community and something you should really be aware of. And I think, uh, hopefully, at least the Army will take a look at that and say, yeah, we can't be doing and be associated with that kind of crap. Yeah. So, until next time, have a good afternoon.